So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the amazing brain. And um, I'm a physician, and I run a hospital, which is a 60-year-old, brand-new, reimagined uh, research institute focusing almost, uh, not entirely, but a uh, significant part of the brain. So I'm just going to ask a quick question. Um, does anybody know how many organs there are in the body? Anybody want to guess? What? 96? No, not quite, but close. I see this little one here. What, what do you think? 19? I'm sorry. 36? No, maybe. A little bit more than that. So depending on where, what resource you go to, there's either 76 or 79 organs, and that's because several organ systems can be sort of relating to one another. For example, the musculoskeletal system, one might call it one system, but in, re in reality it involves bones, muscles, connective tissues, and joints. So it depends on how you relate things. But the, but the brain is one big gall dar organ system, and it includes the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. And I'm going to talk to you today about, um, in connection metaphorically with Isaac Newton's discovery of gravity. So the brain is this amazing machine. And if you think about the brain, unlike any other organ, the brain has the power to do things that we never thought it could do even five, ten years ago. In fact, when I went to medical school, which was in the late 80s, we were taught that once the brain had an impairment or an injury to it, it was done, the anatomy was gone. We now know that's not true, and I want to take you through a little bit of a, an exciting journey about what's happening in the brain. So the power of the brain is incredible, and I'm going to use an analogy. Uh, we can't live without our brains, but I'm going to use an analogy of another organ, which is quite obvious that we can't live without, and that's the heart. So about 50 years ago, places like Cleveland Clinic in particular began to explore the anatomy, the physiology, the function of the heart. And they went deep and wide into discovery of the heart. So we now today, as a result, not only of Cleveland Clinic, but in terms of the application to the human body, we now know through both science and through clinical care, we know what the heart does. It's a mechanical pump. We know how it works. We know how to image it. We know how to intervene for it. We know what drugs affect it. We know how to fix it. We know how to even replace it. As you know, transplants, heart transplants, are not uncommon in this world. We know about 90% of what there is to know about the heart as a result of the last 50 years of science. What we don't know yet, but we're getting closer to, is actually how to repair the heart with its own cells, and even someday, how to regrow the heart. And that's in biologics, and it's probably not too far off. But the interesting thing about the heart, we know that we can't live without a heart. But if something happens to the heart, it stops, okay? Blood supply, it usually stops, or it damages and it's done. The brain is not like that. So what we know about the brain has come to us really in the last five years, if you think about it. There have been two major scientific initiatives in the United States, actually funded, initiated through the United States, but, but participated in around the world, and that is the Human Genome Project, which started about 12 years ago, and the brain, initiative which started about five years ago. And the Human Genome Project, as you know, has mapped the human genome. And what it's created is this extraordinary amount of data, which is really sort of behind the whole, the whole um, moniker of big data. But for us in medicine and science, it's created data, but it's not all that useful to us yet, yet in clinical care. However, the BRAIN initiative, which was started in 2013, actually has extraordinary use in the clinical environment and the research environment. And the BRAIN initiative was a $100 million plus multi-center initiative that, was, that came out of Washington. And so what came out of the BRAIN initiative is our understanding of what the brain looks like, the anatomy, how the brain is wired, how its network works, and how normal function happens. And so what's happening now around the world in certain laboratories is scientists are collecting data on normal brain function, wiring, networking. 
okay? It's, in essence, we're creating this data bank of quote unquote normal brains. This, I love this example here because this is an example basically of the network, all right? If you remember what the brain looks like, there's the gray matter that sits outside the, the brain, which is really where the neurons are, the gray matter, and the white matter deep inside is where the axons are. So if you think of, for those of you young in the audience, the neuron is the cell, okay? And the axon is like a little hair that sticks out of the cell, and what that does is it, create, it drives impulses coming from the cell and launches those impulses into this intracellular space that actually create meaning to the next cell that picks them up, all right? That's how the brain, that's how the nervous system works. Well, this is a beautiful, real picture from the Brain Initiative of forward face, so if I am looking at you like this, of basically our neural network, okay? So these are, this is the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe is back here, and the temporal lobe is up here. This is our corpus callosum, and this is basically that, that wiring that connects, where all the wire connects between both lobes. And then down here is the brainstem, this red, and then here's the cerebellum around it. What's amazing to me is this is a real picture, a real live picture of how the, brain, the brain's wiring works. And just for example, when I learned in medical school, and any of us, I know there's other physicians in the audience, were told before 10 years ago that if the brain, well, first of all, we were told that the right side of the brain, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Here's where you see that neural network happening. So let's say you have something in your motor cortex out here. It would come across here and down through your spinal cord. So my right side controls my left hand. We used to think that if, if something happened to interrupt this network, that this then therefore paralysis on the left side of my body as a result of the, I'm sorry, I'm doing anatomic, of the, as a result of the right side of my brain was d dead and gone. But we now know, actually, through recent studies, that the right side of the body also has right-sided neurons that don't cross over. And that non-crossing over neurons just aren't awake. They're dormant. And there's many other dormant things in the brain I want to talk to you about. So this is, a, this is a, a picture, basically, of the anatomy of the brain and the nervous system. So we have the brain. We have the brain stem, the spinal cord, and then in the spinal cord gives off nerves. There are cells in the spinal cord that gives off peripheral nerves, and the peripheral nerves then go on to control your body. They control the, the, the muscles and the sensation in your body. And, it, and essentially, they control all else because they affect blood vessels and also skin and all sorts of things. So thinking about I want to give you some examples of some interesting thing that, things that we're working on just in the last five to ten years because of our knowledge now knowing that the brain changes. So I want to talk to you a little bit about something called plasticity. So plasticity of the brain is a word that came about about ten years ago. And it basically is the word that states that the brain has this fundamental capability to change its shape and its structure and its function resident for the entire lifespan of the human being. We used to think that this was only prevalent in children or young people. We now know that's not true. We now know that the brain actually fundamentally can change its structure throughout the course of your life. How we engage it to change its structure, to rewire, to retool, to resupplant what it does is what we're working on. So brain plasticity is a is an idea that actually has incredible merit and huge potential in the field of medicine. So let me talk to you about an example of something that we're working on with the neural networks. So memory, and, and I'm going to talk about memory. Memory usually resides in your frontal and your parietal lobes. And memory is a, a complex function of the brain. We can see, we can put people in now uh, functional MRIs, which are very high-powered magnets, and we can ask you to think about a happy mem memory. And we can see parts of your brain light up. We know where that memory is coming from, all right? 
So we have done this with pain patients, chronic pain. Chronic pain is a devastating problem. We all know of the opiate and drug addiction, heroin, and all the, the terrible things going on socially in our society because of pain or perceived pain. So we did this study where we took 100 patients who were in our chronic pain program. This is pain for a long time. It's affected them in bad ways. And we put them through a four-week program. But before we did, we studied the brain in a big 3T magnet, which is a very high-powered magnet that looks at function. So we had them think about their pain. And actually, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to do, because that's why they were there. And we could understand where that pain center was residing for each patient. Then we put them through the four-week program, and we again then imaged their brains. And guess what happened to their brains? That part of their brain got bigger. Statistically, scientifically, verifiably bigger. And it almost approached the normal non-pain brain. Now, what does that mean? We don't know. We're studying now what does that mean, but it's the first study ever where we've shown that we can increase the size of the brain through a behavioral approach. So we've done studies to show that that behavioral programs and even relative to emotional feelings like pain can change the structure of the brain. And now we're working on, so what does that mean? And how, how can we do that? What, what impact is this going to have on patients long term for pain? Another thing we've been able to do with the brain and memory is take that pain, understanding where that pain area is, and through external electrical stimulation, we've been able to basically zap one side of the brain and zap the other side of the brain to work around the pain area so we can, we can show this in magnetic resonance studies where if we zap a certain area, it creates a different pathway to the other side of the brain instead of going through the pain center. Surprisingly, you might think this is quite far out in space, but after several times of zapping to sort of rewire the root of that part of the brain, we can lift the memory of pain right out of the patient's brain. And they don't feel pain. Isn't that interesting? Here's an example of a bionic hand. At our organization, which was formerly called the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, we have the largest bionic medicine research group in the world. There are other commercial entities larger than ours, but we have the largest group. We have figured out how to transplant nerves, those peripheral nerves, that normally would go to an arm if the arm is amputated. Take those nerves from the cell body, transplant them into the chest muscle, rewire the chest muscle, create then very sophisticated myoelectric pickups, which allow us to then reprogram a normal device or an electronic device so that when the patient now says, move your thumb, he can move his thumb or grasp, close, and open and close your hand, he can open and close his hand. This is solely by thinking, it's complete intuition. So brain and peripheral nerve rewiring actually is the forefront of medicine. And it's, it's an oyster that's just starting to open up, unlike the heart. We're probably, you know, 50 years ago where the heart was uh, right now in science. And I just, this is just a, a silly example to show you that we can increase the size of the brain, and by increasing the size of the brain, we can do amazing things. So the implications of brain insight, brain care, brain plasticity, rewiring the brain, brain supplanting the brain, has tremendous uh, impact in clinical care. And in fact, I'll venture to say within the next decade, focal brain injuries, meaning gunshot wounds, strokes, tumor areas, ischemic areas, whatever, focal injuries to the brain in that picture that I saw that you showed in the that I showed in the front will actually be cured, if you will, because we will learn how to work around the injured scar tissue area and create new wiring and teach the patient then how to use the new wiring intuitively, if you will, in the brain to be able to move the limb or do the function that they couldn't do as a result of the in original insult. That's not saying that all brain impairment will be cured because some is disease-based and affects many more neurons than a focal injury. But even a focal injury is the beginning of incredible discovery and incredible future of care uh, relative to patients. 
So, um, you know, I find it, I'll close by saying I find it interesting that today's talk is uh, about defying gravity. And Isaac Newton obviously was sitting under the tree and an apple fell on his head. Well, today we're talking about the brains. Little did, it, little did Isaac know now, several hundreds of years later, certainly we'd be talking about how the brain is now just beginning to divide its gravity that we know of. Thank you very much.